then you compute the epsilon for, so again, the epsilon is this ratio of two bands for all 10 of those tables. And so this is just a graphical representation of what 10 different aerosol models from those 10 different tables look like. So we think we know what the contribution is here. This is just from the lookup table. The spectral, dist the spectral distribution and the visible is from the lookup table. So we've calculated our epsilon. We know here and here. So we know a slope. And then now we know the slopes for all different 10 aerosol models. We do an iteration technique to find out where our observed epsilon falls into here. And you pick eventually down to two bounding models. Okay? Does that make sense? So we have 80 model, we have our measured epsilon, assuming the black pixel. We have 80 models reduced to 10 by knowing what the relative humidity is. We calculate the epsilon for each of those 10 models. And then we find the two lookup table models that most closely match our measured epsilon. So we've narrowed it down from 80 to 2. Once we have selected our two aerosol models, then you can extrapolate into the visible to come up with your final visible aerosol signal. Stated there. Make sense? Yep. And you're only as good as your lookup table. Yeah, and I'll show, I have an example later of that. Yes. Okay, it's a great question that leads into the next section. It is, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's whatever pixel you're viewing at the time. And so you have satellite coming down, you have a full swath. And so there's lines and p there's, there's pixels basically defined in two dimensions, every X and Y. This assumption is every single pixel. Put a pin in that for now. That means so every pixel, if you don't do anything else and you keep this assumption, you are assuming that NIR is black for every single pixel you're looking at. And I can see you already disagree with that assumption, which is good. <laughs> you should. <laughs> so. Um, okay, so b b we're going to go right into that. I just have a final aside. Um, I assume at some point in your um, inversion modeling, what came out of it was we're very good at totals. <laughs> we're really good at total absorption, but subdividing those into pieces is harder. In fact, I might argue that total absorption is by far the best thing that we do. But dividing that into sea down absorption and phytoplankton absorption is really a challenge. The same is true for the atmospheric correction process. That um, the total aerosol signal usually comes out pretty good when our assumptions are met. Um, there's a tendency to use the optical thickness of aerosols and angstroms to infer other things about the aer aerosols. And you can do that. But in your head, 
treat that the same way you would treat your phytoplankton absorptions and your sedum absorptions that there's a robust measurement. When you divide it into its pieces, it gets a little less robust. All right, back to the black pixel assumption. So uh, we're going to do two different case. We're going to do a case study that deals with two different regions. The first is uh, Sargasso Sea near Bermuda. The other is uh, where Sean and I live, which is Chesapeake Bay. There somewhere. So the question I think being posed by the audience now is, Near infrared remote sensing for that reflectance really black. But if you look at the Sargasso Sea here and you zoom in, for the most part, that assumption holds. And that, this is why we were able to be as successful as we were through CZCS and OCTS and even part of CWIFS is if you're away from land, more often than not, this is a decent obsession, upset, uh, assumption. That said, what are we also interested in? Water bodies near our homes different bays, fisheries, and things. And this is a red spectra from, Chesa this red spectra is from Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that this assumption starts to break down. When it breaks down, it breaks down pretty hard. So if you're in a place like Chesapeake Bay, and this is a time series of data in the bottom half of Chesapeake Bay, which is the clearest part of that region, if you don't account for the fact that your assumption is not valid, you start overcorrecting, and that leads into negative values in the visible. And so what you're looking at here are frequency distributions at two different wavelengths, uh, 412 and 443, uh, of just all retrievals in the lower bay for all the data that I had. And you can see that we're getting a ton of negative retrievals here. And even if you accept that, the chlorophyll ends up being elevated relative to truth. So the gray background here is all the field data that was available. And you can see that you're not, you, it, let's say, for example, you just accepted these bands were bad and used other bands, your retrievals are still going to not look very good. This is a time series of that. So this is remote sensor reflectance of 412. You'll see it's almost always negative. These are monthly time series. Um, and then chlorophyll, just to show you again, uh, compared to truth, which are the black dots, much, much higher than it ought to be. So yes, we do this in every pixel, but this assumption isn't great. The community recognizes this. And, that, and there are tons of different ways out there to accommodate an adjustment to this assumption. This is just a small laundry list. Um, they generally fall into four different categories. The first is that you tell the system what your epsilon ought to be, or you tell the system what your near infrared reflectance is, and that alleviates the need to make the assumption. There are a couple of papers here. The other is to, or another is to acknowledge near infrared, this assumption fails, but on a modus and veers, there are shortwave infrared bands, so why don't we use those instead where this is more valid? Um, that's been somewhat successful, but that's mostly because the instruments don't have great signal to noise in those regions. But again, instead of extrapolating from 700 and 800 to 400, now you're doing an extrapolation from like 2130 to 800, so you're suffering through a longer extrapolation distance. Um, there are a number of approaches that try to correct and model non-negligible remote sensing reflectance in the NIR. So rather than providing it, you use, we'll talk about one of these, one kind of model to estimate what it should be so you can subtract it out. And then of course, there are other solutions that just solve for the atmosphere and the ocean at the same time, which can implicitly account for this as well. So we're just going to talk about this bottom one in green here, which is what we're conventionally using at the OBPG. If, so we're using a bio-optical model to take a guess at what the contribution of remote sensing reflectance in the NIR will be. And even with this rudimentary bio-optical model, you can see most of the negatives disappear, or positive generally, and the chlorophyll collapses down to what truth ought to be. So this kind of correction works. I'm only showing this to say it's necessary. If you care about the coast, you care about blooms, this kind of correction is absolutely critical. So 
since you are going to be collecting data for the next two days and you've been learning how the instruments work, um, we're going to take a small departure and where field data come into this. And we'll talk about this bio-optical model a little bit more in depth. We'll go through it pretty quickly, but again, I want you to get a sense of where all the uncertainties are coming from. So we take the original, so this is an iterative process. And so we run one time assuming black pixel. And then you come up with an RRS at 670 for that first iteration. We take a stab at modeling total absorption at this band, which is water, which we think we know, and all particles and dissolved material at 675. The way we model this right now is just a simple regression for a guess at chlorophyll to get this value. And this is the line and it's log space and you can see that there's a lot of error around it. What I want to point out is that even at the top end of this, it's 0.1 inverse meters. Generally we're down in weeds here a little bit more. This doesn't have to be perfect because the contribution of water here is so much bigger than what we're popping out of the model anyway. Okay, from that, uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but we do an F over Q correction. You've probably seen this term already, a G term. Yep. So in this case, we're using the model of Andre Morel. We know this, we know this, we know this, so we can derive backscattering at 670. But now we want to extrapolate backscattering at 670 back into the near infrared. To do that, you need a guess at the spectral slope of backscattering. Currently, we're using Zhang Ping Li's model uh, embedded into QAA. This is his equation. You'll note that it uses a ratio of blue and green bands. This is the field data from the original paper. And while this does a nice job of working, I want to point out the scatter in all of this. And so when you're making your measurements and you've already done your backscattering la uh, laboratories, I assume, again, field data, very important. Best quality you can give us, very important, because whether you know it or not, your field data goes into our atmosphere correction. Okay, so from there, now we can estimate what backscattering at 765 is. So this is all roughly an empirical solution to get there. Then we can reconstruct remote sensing reflectance at 675 using what we've modeled, the contribution of water, and a G factor for morale from a lookup table. And the reason that we don't try to do anything else and say that water is sufficient is at that wavelength, it is dominating the, ups, the signal. So a simple rudimentary bio-optical model to get a guess on remote sensing reflectance at an NIR band. Yes? It's the 670, yeah. Yeah, I think his table only goes to Maris's 680, whatever, yeah. Yep. Right. We iterate until this value stops changing, which is usually three to four iterations. So where is this applied? Here is global map, land is in black, gray is where chlorophyll is less than 0.3 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, and white is where it's greater than 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter. Anything that is in gray, this correction is not applied, so this gives you a spatial distribution of where the black pixel assumption actually fairly well holds up. Boo, and it's between. Well, of course. What, wait, what? There will be lots of patches inside here where this fails, <laughs> but generally speaking, yeah. Um, from 0.3 to 0.7, it's got weighted use, and then it's fully applied when chlorophyll is against seven. Heidi raises an interesting point. This is driven by chlorophyll. So it's one of many models that we have inside of the atmosphere correction driven by chlorophyll. And think back. What are the two bands used to calculate chlorophyll? Uh, 
Do you, have you gotten to that yet? 443, 555. What are the two bands you use to calculate backscattering spectral slope? Also diffuse attenuation, also POC. So lots of empiricism, lots of field data inside. If you have more questions, Sean's in the back of the room. All right, down to the final two. This is a bi-directional reflectance correction. This is the Morel thing that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Ha, 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 ha. 
afraid, afraid so. So embrace it. Pardon? Embrace it. Embrace, embrace it, yeah. Not well. <laughs> oh, I don't know how they're doing. We're not doing it well. Let's muscle through the last two so we can go eat. Um, okay, so the, these last two terms here deal mostly with our need to take the satellite-derived remote sensing reflectance and make it look like the field measurements that we're making. So without, you don't need these implicitly, and you could have a perfect RRS if you do everything else really, really well but it is tied explicitly to the characteristics of the satellite. And that'll make a little bit more sense in a second. So let's start with this um, bidirectional reflectance correction. And this is just a cartoon to illustrate why this is important. So let's just uh, make a, um, first cartoon is to indicate that we're making an in situ measurement at one time of day. And then time passes, the sun rises higher in the sky, maybe whatever's in the water is migrating south, and then there is the time of the satellite measurement. And so time has passed, the sun is a different position, the water may not look the same, which I just said. So we apply a normalization to our RRS. And this accounts for the sun's changing position in the sky, partially, 
um, which is important because of its path length through the atmosphere, the path length of the light traveling through the atmosphere, transmission of light through the air-sea interface as the angular geometry changes, but also that there are angular features in the in-water volume scattering, a function that we want to account for. The reason we do this, again, is if we're trying to validate our satellite, we want to make sure that we're, to the best of our ability, apples to apples with whatever truth we're actually using. Okay? The way that this is accomplished is through that Morel um, 2002 paper that I was referencing in previous slides here. So it's a pretty simple approach in the sense that it's lookup table based, keyed on chlorophyll, the geometries of the sun in the sensor, where you create a normalization factor by taking the ratio of what um, f over q uh, looks like at the time of your observation to what f over q would look like with an overhead sun. So you would to do this absolutely perfectly in a matchup validation system, you apply this correction to both your field data and to the satellite data. It's by default turned on in our data processing. Um, and just to give you a quick sense of the magnitude of the correction, this is from this paper where you have chlorophyll on this axis. You have the ratio of F at the time of an overhead sun to F at a observation and you can see that the correction ranges anywhere from uh, null up one down to 40 percent so it can be big under certain conditions spectrally uh, it's represented here for three different chlorophyll values where the difference between the dashed and the solid lines just indicate the magnitude of the change Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gothic R. Yeah. Not R. Not R. Gothic R. And it changes bigger when the is higher. Right. So it makes bigger Right. And so. What's that? Right, so this was generated based on hydrolyte Monte Carlo simulations for one volume phase, phase function for, it was water, but it was just, was it two? Oh, the, the P does, okay. Okay. It's basically what's called the new, the new case one model. Yeah, there you go. Morel invented that IOP model for this calculation, and then I put it in the hyperlight and called it the new, new case one. There you go. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, so the chlorophyll for the satellite correction is the default chlorophyll algorithm. And so you basically calculate chlorophyll using uncorrected or non-exact RRS, then use that chlorophyll to calculate your correction, and then, so you're using a derived product to adjust your radiances. No. And there are alternate approaches being suggested, in fact, these kinds of AOP to IOP relationships are becoming, uh, studies are becoming more and more frequent. So this is what NASA currently uses operationally, but there have been IOP-centric approaches published, um, and there's a couple of other studies that are actively ongoing to try to implicitly account for these differences in volume scattering function in an inversion versus having to do it in a stepwise fashion. Then last, since we're at the 90-minute mark, uh, a spectral bandpass correction. So why do we care? Well, just in a conversational sense, most of the, in, at least back in the CWIFS era, most of the filters applied to your in situ radiometer were fairly rectangular. And so when you said it was between 555 
and a 550 and 555 if you know you had a 10 nanometer bandwidth sorry 550 and 560 this would be 555 you make most of these radiometers do not have light coming in from outside this wavelength range the satellite radiometers are not always as good and so this black curve here is the spectral response function for CWIFs. And so when we say it's 555, yes, most of the light coming in is at 555. But there's light coming in at other wavelengths as well. And if you pull way back out, uh, you can see that there are some substantial blue and red contributions going into CWIFs' measurement of 555. And so we make an adjustment to this to correct that out. Why do we care? Again, satellite remote sensing, why do we care in the context of this class is we're using another bio-optical model here. Um, so the other reason you care in the context of this class too is you can disable this dependent on the measurement you're making in the field. So back in the day, when you only had seven channels on your radiometer, you would want to have this correction enabled. Now, you have a hyperspectral radiometer. And so you have to make a decision if you want to do apples to apples. You can either take your hyperspectral measurements and apply you know, an 11 nanometer box over the center of interest and make your in situ measurement look like what comes out of this correction. Or you can disable this correction entirely, but in that case, you need to take your hyperspectral instrument and your hyperspectral data and apply the satellite bandpass to it. So you have some choices here. But if you don't do this, you are not going to truly be doing apples to apples in your satellites to in situ measurement. So what does the bio-optical model look like? In this case, we're using a chlorophyll-driven reflectance model for Morel, Morel and Mariterrena. Um, what you're looking at here is effectively just different remote sensing reflectances for various chlorophyll levels running from 0.03 down to 10. You should be familiar with these kinds of spectra by now. How do we come up with our adjustment? I'll try to walk through this uh, clearly, intelligently. Um, so for every satellite band and for every chlorophyll step in all of these models, uh, So for every chlorophyll in this figure, you take the remote sensing reflectance and you calculate the 10 nanometer mean to mimic what the in situ measurement might be with a, 11 nan a 10 nanometer bandpass. Then you apply the full spectral response of the satellite and you calculate a second RRS. So in this case, the 10 nanometer uh, one is indicated in red and then the full spectral response with all of the leakages and so forth is the one in black. Then you calculate the ratio of the two, which in this case is the little blue line. So that's for one wavelength and one chlorophyll. You do this repeatedly. So this is for one wavelength here, and you generate a series of curves that effectively look something like this. So the correction in this case is the ratio, which is this blue line here, which I'll know can run, in this example, runs from about plus or minus 5%. The way that this is executed in operation is to take the full band satellite remote sensing reflectances at 490 and 555 and ratio them. You take this data and express it as a function of that ratio. And then you get this value here, which is our correction factor. Okay. To adjust the satellite measurement to these 10 nanometer rectangular band passes, you apply this correction. The satellite measurement at every wavelength multiplied by the correction factor gives you an, an out of band spectral response corrected satellite measurement that you can compare with your field data. So, in this case, you, you I'll just give you an example of CWIFS at 443. This is what the spectral response function looks like. The correction factor in this case is 2% both directions. CWIFS at band 5, under certain very, very low chlorophyll conditions, the correction can be up to 8%. So now we're using a chlorophyll derivative case 1 model to, again, adjust our radiances 
you're popping out of the end of the system with a correction of up to 10%. But not all is bad. I don't have it shown here, but CWIS is the worst case scenario. With time, these filters have become better, and the correction for MODIS, Aqua at least, is 1% or 2% in all bands. But again, to see how the sausage is being made, you need to understand all of these corrections are being applied so that when you go and you download RRS from the Ocean Color website at NASA, this is what you're getting. Every step you've seen so far. So Colin, sorry. Yep, you can. Yeah. So Veers is doing that right now, isn't it? Nah, we're not. This correction's not changing. space. 
Yeah, I'm glad you, you wrote it down. <laughs> And then it's perfect in the end. Of course. So. And also for you as students, you, you know, you might see something that you don't like here. You know exactly. Hopefully you saw something you didn't like. So this is everything we covered. This is the satellite data flow. Uh, we won't belabor it. It's there for your reference. It's um, a figure from the TM as well too. But we talked about all of these things. Um, skipping ahead real quick. Uh, this is a scorecard for ancillary data. So again, if you see something you don't like, there are places to help here. But uh, list of the sources, list of the uses, list of all the different data products that we get uh, on global scales, but then there are also lookup tables and coefficients. And this is not exhaustive, but there's a lot that goes into this. Um, I don't think we want to hear me talk anymore today, so we won't go into to single multiple scattering, adjacency effects, other things, but I do like this plot as an example of why absorbing aerosols are a real pain in all of our asses. So remember, we're getting an epsilon here and here. And we're choosing between models in this part of the spectrum. And we're extrapolating out here. We have no information that tells us if one of these curves is actually bending in the blue. And this is what absorbing aerosols tend to do. What makes why they're called absorbing aerosols is they absorb in this part of the spectrum. But right now, with the way we're doing things, um, yeah, this is a big problem. Yeah. So with that, a moment of zen, because our RRS are perfect. And then you can do cool stuff like this. So this is the, uh, if I can hit it. So, no, you can't do cool stuff like this. <sighs> That's a terrible way to finish. <laughs> I have the original file. No, I'm going to make everybody wait for lunch now. <laughs> ah. Okay, this is, uh, I show this. The back row is so sick of seeing this, I'm sure. <laughs> um, this is the uh, 10th anniversary bio. Mobius already passed. Nah. And as Colin and I can tell you, if this were Modus, this would be black forever. <laughs> you can't just go, no, yeah, no trees. So anyway, that's all I got. Um, so thanks for hanging in there for two hours. I think it's lunchtime. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, we can talk. We'll talk about that in the CDS lab. your eyes.